Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 63 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Happy New Year! It's 2016, and I don't know about you, but I always start the new year with a hopeful outlook. It always feels like I have a clean slate or a, a clean canvas to set and accomplish new goals and have new experiences. For example, today, I am optimistic that I am going to finish my book in 2016. My book, which I have tentatively titled America's First Gateway, Albany and the Making of America, explores how the people of Albany, New York, created first Dutch, then British, and finally American identities between 1614 and 1830. The book is a revision of my dissertation, and I made some progress on it in 2015, but I really want to finish the book because I have already started to research and write my second book, which is on the Articles of Confederation. I really want to devote more time to that project and to perhaps maybe another podcast or video cast. So I have created a plan to meet my goal of finishing my book by the end of the year. Did you set any New Year's resolutions or goals in 2016? Now, it's actually fitting that we're having this chat about new beginnings because today's episode ties in with the idea of starting over and starting fresh. Today, we'll meet and chat with Megan Kate Nelson, a historian of the American Civil War and author of Ruin Nation, Destruction and the American Civil War. Now, you may be thinking, Liz, Civil War Ruin Nation sounds more like a depressing topic than a hopeful topic, and perhaps you're right. But regardless, it's a fascinating topic. And as you will discover, Megan's passion for her topic will make ours an upbeat conversation about death and destruction. Our conversation will cover topics like why Union and Confederate commanders thought that they could end the Civil War by destroying the enemy's capital city. The opportunities created by the destruction wrought by the Civil War and the place of ruins in American memory and landscapes. But before we get to our discussion of the ruin nation wrought by the Civil War, I would be grateful if you would consider supporting Ben Franklin's world as part of your New Year's resolution. There are many ways you can help. One way is by making a financial contribution. Other ways involve subscribing to the show or downloading its free app from the Google Play or iTunes app stores, or by telling your friends and family about the show. To learn more about how you can support Ben Franklin's world, please visit benfranklinsworld.com slash movement or text support BF world to 33444. Have I created enough pre-show suspense? Are you ready to explore the destruction caused by the Civil War? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest today is a writer, cultural critic, and historian. Her research interests include environmental history, material culture, and the American Civil War. She has written for numerous publications, including the New York Times and Civil War Times, and she has published two books, Trembling Earth, A Cultural History of the Okefenokee Swamp, and, most recently, Ruin Nation, Destruction and the American Civil War. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Megan Kate Nelson. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Megan, as a historian, you wear many hats, yet you don't actually have a Ph.D. in history, but American studies. Would you tell us what American studies are and how this training adds to your ability to speak and write about history? So American studies is a field that does two things a little differently uh, than the field of history. One is that American studies scholars ask questions about what happened, um, but we also ask questions about how people imagined what happened and how they created 
myths and narratives around these events, this basically means that we are cultural historians. American studies scholars can focus on a lot of different things, history, literature, music, popular culture, all kinds of things. But for my purposes, I sort of practice American studies in the cultural history tradition. Um, The other thing uh, that American studies scholars do is that we use a very wide range of sources so that we have an interdisciplinary methodology. So the written word, of course, always vital and important, but also visual images and material culture, scientific data in some cases. For my purposes, with the kind of focus I have, the landscape itself and using a lot of kind of geographical and archaeological information to inform my arguments. So in the context of Civil War history, which as a field is a little more traditional in terms of its historical questions and methods, coming from an American studies background really enables me to consider subjects like ruins and sources that very few people, uh, very few Civil War historians have considered or used before. So you have a smattering of English, philosophy, art history, and history going on in your practice of history. Yes. Now, you have to admit, your practice of history has kind of taken a dark turn. Death, destruction, ruination, and war are really dark topics. How did you come to write and research a book about them? They really are dark topics. And I'm not a particularly dark person, as you know. Although I did joke in 2012 when the book came out that it was the feel-good book of the year with all of this talk of destruction and all of these different ways. So I came to the study of ruins and destruction through the study of swamps, actually. So when I was researching my dissertation, which turned into my first book, Trembling Earth, I kept running into ruins in different places. And I thought they were really interesting, first from an aesthetic standpoint, that ruins are sort of interesting to look at, but also from a historical standpoint, in that they point really to failure in many ways, which Americans don't usually like to talk about. And so I started to think about them in the context of 19th century America, in American history and culture. And luckily, uh, I knew enough to know that a book about 19th century ruins, such a huge topic, wouldn't really work. Um, So I decided to focus on the moment that produced the most ruins in the American landscape, which was the Civil War era. So I came to the Civil War really from ruins. It was a new subject area for me, and then just went on from there and was sort of surprised to see how many different forms of destruction kind of occurred during the Civil War. In fact, the Civil War armies seemed to be obsessed with destruction. The Union and Confederate armies really believed that if they captured and destroyed the capital of the other side, that they would end the war. So would you tell us how and why Union officers thought that the destruction of the Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia, and that the Confederate officers thought that the destruction of the Union capital at Washington, D.C. would end the war? The interesting thing about this is that that cities have been military targets for thousands of years. So the Civil War armies were sort of acting with this very long tradition uh, behind them and sort of this approach to the larger strategy, which was to take the enemy's capital city. And the argument for this was twofold, which was, one, this is the political center of the enemy nation. And if you took that capital, that meant that the government would fall. And for most 19th century Americans, the nation was about feeling and about the people, but it was also about the government. So if the government imploded, then the nation would perhaps no longer exist. Also, American cities not only had political centers and sort of the center of civic life, but they were also centers of production. They had factories within their borders, and in this context, they were creating war material. And this is another reason why they became targets, because both Union and Confederate armies were very interested in shutting down the other side's ability to produce weapons and uniforms and all the things that basically make waging war possible. It's also true that most American cities are at some sort of transportation crossroads, either at an intersection of wagon roads or railroads, or they're on a waterway. And that was also very important to supplying armies. So if you could take the enemy's city 
especially its capital, which was um, you know, strategically located, that you could cut off the supply line for the enemy and, again, bring an end to the war itself. Did either army succeed in capturing the other's capital? Only at the very, very end of the war. Uh, the Union Army was able to take Richmond in April of 1865, just about a week before the ultimate surrender of Lee's army at Appomattox. They had laid siege to that city, had tried to approach it and take it from the very beginning of the war and had never succeeded because of Richmond's very strong uh, defensive fortifications and also because of some bungling on the part of of generals who could just never get the strategy uh, quite right. Um, But they were only enabled to take the city because the Confederates who were defending it actually pulled out of Richmond in early April and left it undefended. Did the Union destroy Richmond once they had it? Well, actually, Richmond is a very interesting example. And this is one of the arguments I try to make in the book overall, that the Union Army destroyed a lot of of towns and cities. But the Confederates destroyed a lot of towns and cities as well. And they did so in another kind of military tactic, which was defensive burning. So on their way out of town, the Confederates set fire to all the war material that they did not want the Union to get their hands on. And this is what started the fire that ultimately consumed about one-third of Richmond's urban landscape. There's actually, as you mentioned, a lot of destruction that happens during the Civil War. In Ruin Nation, Megan covers four areas of destruction. The destruction of cities that we've just talked about, the destruction of homes, the destruction of forests and landscapes, and of human bodies. Megan, before we leave cities completely, would you tell us about the destruction of Columbia, South Carolina? So the Union Army had been trying to get to both Columbia, the capital of South Carolina, and Charleston since very early in the war, um, just as they were trying to get to Richmond. Because of their locations, though, these cities were pretty well defended, and neither one of them fell until February of 1865. Columbia was a target because it was the capital um, of what many Union soldiers, generals, and political leaders really believed was the cradle of secession. Since South Carolina had seceded first from the Union, they began that process in Columbia and then moved and did the final vote in Charleston. Union soldiers were itching to get into South Carolina again from the very beginning, but the first chance that they got was with William Tecumseh Sherman's army, which uh, was in the, operating in the Southeastern Theater in 1864. Uh, they had taken Atlanta in September. They would marched across Georgia in November and December. And then they set out northward to take South Carolina and to sort of approach Richmond from the south. So Sherman's army really had been burning and looting their way through the state before they even got to Columbia. Um, and when they arrived at the city, they're sort of across the river, from the city of Columbia on February 16th, you know, they were filled with this ecstatic kind of glee. And the mayor of the city actually capitulated. He gave up the city and surrendered it. The Confederates had pulled out a couple of hours before. And so the Union soldiers moved into the city. And what happened after that is a matter of great dispute. And this is why I wanted to write about Columbia in this first chapter of Ruin Nation, because There was destruction in this city over the course of about a day and a half. Again, about a third of of Columbia was consumed in a huge fire. But it was the debate about who was actually responsible for this fire that continued to rage on, actually, into the 1880s. And if you go to Columbia today, people still argue about this, about who was responsible. I mean, most Columbia residents who feel very strongly about this, of course, still blame Sherman. Um, But... Really, the answer is there were a lot of factors in play. There was a lot of cotton and a lot of other kind of combustible material piled in the streets. A couple of fires kindled when the Union soldiers got in there, and then it just got out of hand. There was a very heavy wind blowing, which, you know, blew the flames and blew all of these sort of filaments of cotton all around. And businesses were burned and homes were burned. And Union soldiers and Columbia civilians kind of stood outside in the streets uh, watching this happen, and and they engaged in some very angry exchanges um, on the streets, which was also part of this interesting moment of destruction that was really evidence of how armies kind of act in this different kind of field of battle where the home front becomes the battlefield. (laughs) 
throughout history, where some people see destruction, others see opportunity. Were there any opportunity seekers who came to Columbia or other cities that had been destroyed during the Civil War to seek new opportunities and make their fortunes? There were. And this is also a larger argument of the book, that, that there are all these acts of destruction, but simultaneously they are acts of creation. Any act of obliteration kind of necessarily creates all kinds of things. It creates ruins, it creates um, all kinds of different meanings, um, emotions, and then also, as you as you rightly point out, opportunities. And the destruction of cities did provide opportunities, especially in the short term in some places. In Hampton, Virginia, which is the first case study in this chapter, enslaved people who had freed themselves by running to the Union's Fortress Monroe were able to make homes in the ruins of Hampton, beginning in 1861, until kind of the end of the war when a lot of Confederates came back to claim their property. But they also, this destruction also provided opportunities for enterprising bricklayers and carpenters who began advertising uh, in newspapers in Columbia and in Richmond and in Charleston, basically a few weeks uh, after the war. They also provided opportunities, interestingly, for photographers who would usually arrive in these cities anywhere from, you know, a couple days to a year after they were destroyed and kind of set up their cameras and take photographs of urban destruction, which for some interesting reasons that I go into in the book are are very aesthetically pleasing. Ruins, uh, particularly architectural ruins, take a really good photograph. And photographers knew that images of southern cities destroyed, of these sort of towering ruins of mills and of churches, would be very popular with both northerners and southerners who wanted to buy these images and put them either in their war albums or tack them up in their homes. So it did provide a lot of opportunities. And later uh, in Reconstruction, I think northern capitalists also saw great opportunities in these southern cities were sort of rebuilding the south, the sort of architectural and economic reconstruction of urban areas. When I think about the destruction of cities during the Civil War, my mind flashes back to scenes from Gone with the Wind. And I keep picturing Scarlet in the wagon and she's riding away from the flaming ruins of whichever city she happens to be in and of the scene where she's at her home. I don't remember whether it's in the city or at her plantation family home, but she's fighting off a Union soldier. What did destruction of cities and their occupation by the Union Army mean for Southern women? That's a great question. And yes, I mean, the Gone with the Wind has probably done more than any other uh, film to shape Americans' sort of perception of destruction in the South. Not only that amazing scene of the burning of Atlanta, um, which quite rightly attributes most of the burning to the Confederates who were withdrawing, who did in fact defensively burn Atlanta at that point, um, although it was destroyed later before the Union pulled out in November. But when she goes back, and there is a great scene where she goes to Twelve Oaks, and and there's just a staircase to nowhere, and it is the, that plantation has been completely burned. And then that amazing scene that you're talking about where uh, this kind of scraggly Union soldier comes and she's on the stairs in her house, which has been saved because it was a Union headquarters, and he approaches her in a very menacing way as if he's going to attack her, and she shoots him and, with the help of Melly, uh, buries him out in the yard, (laughs) which is this sort of astonishing moment uh, that doesn't get a lot of attention in that film, but I think it's a really important scene. You know, that soldier in the film was a straggler. He was kind of lagging behind the army that was marching and fighting in in the Atlanta area. But it is true that Union armies who occupied southern cities kind of they soldiers and civilians, particularly female civilians, came into contact with one another in those places a lot and in ways that created a lot of, of tensions. Probably the most famous example is New Orleans, which was actually not destroyed. Uh, the city was surrendered without a fight in April of 1862, even though there was a, a battle up to its banks. But in that city, Union General Benjamin Butler was so enraged by the actions of the women in New Orleans who were spitting on soldiers and insulting them openly in the streets that he issued General Order Number 28, which is referred to as the Woman Order, uh, in which women who were doing these things, who were um, perceived to be insulting or they're showing contempt for Union soldiers, 
would be treated as women of the town plying their vocation, avocation, which means they would be treated as prostitutes and they would be arrested, which, you know, there has been a lot of discussion of this order among Civil War historians of gender and occupation and what this really meant uh, in terms of navigating these sort of boundaries when you have an occupying force. And there were also more violent interactions. Some historians have found through going through Union military court records that the Union actually prosecuted around 450 sexual assault crimes over the course of the war and in the years afterwards. And these were trials on behalf of both white and black women um, in the South who had suffered assaults on the part of Union soldiers. So there were violent interactions. There were sexual assaults. A lot of these happened within homes, within the slave quarter, where there were kind of private spaces where usually women had domain, but encroaching soldiers kind of took that power and used the privacy of the bedchamber to assault women. We still don't know exactly how many assaults there were, certainly more than 450. Many went unreported. Many soldiers went unpunished for these actions. But for your listeners who are interested, there's a really great book um, edited by Leanne Weitz and Alicia Long called Occupied Women, in which many scholars sort of take on this issue of occupation and what it meant specifically for, mostly for, the women in these cities and also the Union soldiers who were occupying them. The Civil War also brought ruin to slavery. What did the Union's march through the South mean for slaves? In previous wars, like in the Revolution and the War of 1812, if the American army catches a slave, they usually make them a camp worker or give them back into the position of slavery. But Lincoln outlaws slavery in the Confederate States in his Emancipation Proclamation. So what opportunities or what happens to the slaves after or during the Civil War? Well, even before the Emancipation Proclamation, enslaved people were taking the opportunity that the war presented to escape from bondage. And um, as I mentioned before in the the example of Hampton, that was May of 1861 uh, that the first fugitive slaves showed up at Fortress Monroe because the Union Army was kind of making inroads in the South, especially in Virginia and in Florida and other parts of the Gulf South, pretty early on in the war. And where the army went, enslaved populations really perceived them as a liberating army even before the Emancipation Proclamation. So what ended up happening uh, is that the Union government actually issued a law saying that fugitive slaves could be treated as the contraband of war, or even any slaves that the Union Army came across. And so they could be used, if they were being used in the war effort, and that was the language, um, either that they were being used to dig trenches or work in factories to make ammunition, that then they could be confiscated, basically. And this basically, this was never specifically applied really in that way, but it did allow for Union armies to offer kind of shelter and also work to fugitive slaves. But then, of course, after 1863, the impact of the Emancipation Proclamation, it's a little bit hard to gauge because the Emancipation Proclamation is actually a very complicated (laughs) document, um, which frees slaves in some areas of the South and not in others. And of course, Southerners didn't see that the Emancipation Proclamation had any legitimacy at all. But for enslaved people, this provided other opportunities to either work as laborers in the Union Army or to enlist as soldiers or both. Many soldiers enlisted, African-American soldiers, and ended up laboring uh, for much of their much of their time until um, they were thrown into action in, in certain cases. But this was one of the things that, you know, when we talk about armies and their function and their purpose, after 1863, the purpose of the Union Army was expressly to destroy slavery which did not necessarily mean the destruction of the slave quarter or the plantation, but sometimes Union soldiers took it upon themselves to interpret it in that way. Another casualty of the Civil War were Southern forests and landscapes. In Ruin Nation, Megan describes in great detail how the Union and Confederate need for lumber altered these landscapes. Megan, 
Mortimer would like to know more about the army's need for wood and the effect that this had on the South's forests. Sure, yeah. I mean, armies needed wood for all kinds of things, you know, as you listed before, firewood and railroad ties and roads and bridges and shelters and fortifications. They were they were great builders, these armies. And this is also this also goes to my larger point that um destruction was also creation. They were cutting down trees, but mostly uh, they were doing this in order to build other things if they were not actually consuming the wood in their fires. So I argue in the book that northern and southern armies together consumed more than two million trees during the war. And as sometimes happens, when you publish a book, uh, you find out afterwards that perhaps your data was not so accurate. Um, So... After the book was published, I gave some talks and talked to some forestry folks who determined uh, with me that my num- that number is actually probably too low and that it was probably more about 4 million trees. So if there is a second edition of Ruin Nation, that number will change um, to 4 million trees. And what's interesting about that number is that it sounds like it's a lot, right? I mean, that sounds like really a lot of trees. And it is. But in the context of the landscape of the South in the 1860s, it was less than 1% of the region's forest cover. There was intensive clearing in some places, Virginia especially, um, where the largest armies were both engaged in battle and in marching and where they spent the winter building small towns uh, out of wood and building a lot of fires. But overall... Both armies' use of wood did not decimate southern forests. It actually didn't even come close. Did the Union and Confederate armies ever make their way to the north and alter its landscape? They did. The main Confederate army in the field, um, the Army of Northern Virginia under Robert E. Lee, uh, came north twice, once in 1862 and once in 1863. uh, And those campaigns culminated first in the Battle of Antietam and then in the, the Battle of Gettysburg. Both of these campaigns didn't last very long. The Union Army was able to stop Uh, the Confederates at both of these places and push them back into Virginia. Where they went, though, there was a, you know, a trail of destruction because an an army, uh, I think as one contemporary put it, was like a swarm of locusts, right? Uh, Wherever they go, it's thousands of men marching on roads, consuming all kinds of things, um, fence rails and animals and turning up the roads. And so you could see uh, their path, right? They sort of carved their way through the landscape. But the destruction in the north as a result of campaigns and marches and battles was nowhere near uh, as intensive as in the south. There are some interesting, and and I didn't get a chance to kind of research this angle, but environmental historians are very interested in environmental impacts that are not direct, in that perhaps there was um, destruction in the forests of Maine uh, in order to supply the Union Army with railroad ties and other kinds of wood products that they needed that they couldn't get directly um, from the environment in which they were camped or they were marching or they were fighting. Um, So that's an interesting angle to take, too. There may have been some northern destruction um, that we wouldn't necessarily think of because the war was not actually uh, occurring in terms of battles in those places. Of course, the only northern town to be destroyed was Chambersburg, Pennsylvania uh, in 1864. What about the West? There are Western states. California is a state during the Civil War. Were there any changed landscapes or destruction that occurred out West? Uh, No. And for a very, very interesting reason, there were battles, only a small skirmish or two in California, but the real action between the Union and Confederate armies was in New Mexico territory along the Rio Grande uh, in 1862, also a campaign that didn't last very long, just a couple of months without the kinds of numbers that we see in the East. So while in the Eastern theater, you have really large armies engaged with one another, anywhere from 45,000 to 100,000, sometimes more soldiers on each side, although more in the North than in the South. Uh, In the West, the armies were about 3,000 strong, which is not a lot of men. So the impact on the environment is not going to be as great. Plus, in this theater, 
the desert environment exerted a lot of pressures on armies, um, sort of forced them to keep moving. And if you have an army that keeps moving, they actually do not destroy as much of the environment as armies that stay put which is an interesting kind of fact. So the armies in the West were much more mobile and they did not destroy as much as the environment and did not actually leave as many kind of marks on the landscape as in the Eastern theater. The Union and Confederate armies destroyed landscapes, they destroyed cities, they destroyed homes, and they also destroyed bodies. Megan, What was the death and casualty rate of the American Civil War? So for a long time, uh, based on Army records, Civil War historians believe that around 620,000 people died in the Civil War on both sides, with another kind of 900,000 to a million people missing or captured and wounded. And those three numbers together kind of make up what we think of as casualty rates, um, the sort of killed, missing, and wounded. But the number that people have really focused on is the number killed, which for a long time, again, was that 620,000. And then in 2011, David Hacker uh, published an article in the Journal of Civil War History um, that argued that by reading census records to determine death rates, we could actually revise that number of uh, killed in the war to something between 750,000 and 850,000. And the reason for this is that what Hacker was doing was suggesting that there were men who survived the war itself, but ultimately died from war-related injuries or illnesses. And that if you track them through the census records, that increases the number of, of quote-unquote, civil war deaths by about 130 to 200,000. The critics of this approach have come from a couple of different angles, but one of them, which I think is interesting, uh, suggests that Even this 750 to 850 number is probably also low because the census records do not take into account the undocumented deaths of fugitive slaves and those people who, women and men and children who were living and then dying in contraband camps. Um, So if we take that number also into account with a, a pretty conservative estimate, now Civil War historians are thinking that maybe it's something between 850,000 to a million uh, Civil War deaths. And people didn't just die. They were mutilated. When you think of the Civil War and Civil War medicine, you think of amputation. What was the experience like for amputees? Like, what is the process of by which their limbs were amputated? And what happened when they returned home? Amputees were interesting to me because they were most visibly kind of ruins of war made material and movable um, and mobile and alive. And that's a very different kind of ruinous experience and example than architecture. And what's interesting about Civil War medical history is how much they knew and how much they did not know going into these battles and and establishing field hospitals. Um, A surprising number of men actually survived the initial amputation surgery, which is sort of remarkable to consider. Um, We generally agree that about 60,000 men underwent amputation as a result of their battle injuries, both north and south, and about 45,000 survived. So that's about a 75% uh, survival rate, which is quite high, higher, I think, than most people would assume. Um, Some of those men later uh, succumbed to infection because Again, the state of knowledge at this time, medical knowledge, uh, did not include any knowledge of sepsis or infection or uh, any of those kind of ancillary um, issues that can actually kill you uh, within a hospital as you are being treated. And so when these 45,000 men then went back home, um, and about two-thirds of them were northern and about one-third were southern, They really struggled. I mean, this amputation was physically traumatic. It was emotionally traumatic. And when these men went home, they really had to adjust to the lives that they had left before. Most of them had been farmers or manual laborers. And 
when they went back home with either a missing leg or a prosthetic or a missing arm or two, it became very difficult to do this work again. And for American men in the 1860s, you know, their masculinity was centered on their ability to work and support families and uh, woo women and have children. And amputees were really worried about how they were going to be able to do all of these things um, with their missing limbs. These are like living ruins. At 45,000, there have to be enough that seeing a Union or Confederate veteran with a missing limb is a common day occurrence. Yes. And people actually remarked about this, about the number of amputees who were proliferating uh, on the streets of towns and cities kind of across the nation. Um, And it's not like amputation was completely unknown. It had been practiced um, for for many years as a, a medical approach to curing disease, and increasingly during the 1830s and 40s, as industrial accidents became common, uh, you would see a lot of amputations in the wake of these kinds of accidents and those kinds of industrial situations. But it was so unusual, just like seeing mangled bodies on the battlefield uh, in photographs and in illustrations, it was shocking to see so many more men out in the streets and the neighborhoods and the fields uh, missing these limbs. And for Northerners, at least amputees had, they had pensions, uh, and they also had uh, either money or prosthetics provided to them through a federal program. Southern veterans were not so lucky. Sometimes they got aid, uh, received aid from states, uh, but they did not receive the kind of pension benefits or the prosthetics that Northern soldiers did. So for Southerners, uh, the situation, I think, was even more dire. And again, if your listeners want to know more about Southern uh, amputee veterans, Brian Craig Miller has just published a book called Empty Sleeves about amputation in the Civil War South, where he focused on that group in particular and their adjustment, not only their experiences with amputation, but their adjustment uh, to life after the war in the South. You mentioned photography, and I find it fascinating that Americans were, back during the Civil War, and even in our present day, just seem fascinated by the images we have of the destroyed landscapes and the dead Civil War soldiers strewn across the battlefield. What is the obsession with Civil War photography? Was the Civil War the first American war that had photography? It was, indeed. It was the first American war, and it was one of the first wars globally that was fully photographed. There were more photographers in the Eastern Theater uh, than in the Trans-Mississippi West and almost none in the Far Western Theater. And there were more Northern photographers and Southern photographers, which explains a lot about the kinds of images um, that proliferated and how many have, have survived and come down to us today. Again, this was a very, it was very shocking to see bodies mangled and bleeding in the battlefield because I mean, death was obviously common. Mortality rates were higher than they were today um, in America during the 1860s. But these men were being killed in such violent ways um, and all together. And this is what really struck viewers very forcibly. And one of the reasons, not just the the images of bodies, but the the images of destruction and, and all these other forms were very popular is because they were actually aesthetically pleasing. Photographers did not just go and take what we would call documentary photographs, where you're just taking shots and and not framing or deliberately choosing your site. I mean, I think a lot of people think that photographs, especially during this period, are sort of truth. But actually, photographers did a lot of shaping of the scene. They deliberately chose to take their uh, photographs from places that depicted bodies in such a way that, yes, they were horrifying, but they were also kind of symmetrical. The image was balanced. It had all sorts of different sight lines that appealed to your eyes. So there are many aesthetic reasons why images of destruction are very pleasing to people. And I think there's also, I mean, there is a real cultural attraction that we have to destruction. I mean, think about the number of films and television shows that we see every day that are dedicated to killing people and to destroying cities, or how riveted Americans were on 9-11 when they were watching, everyone was watching 
on the television as the Twin Towers were burning and then fell. These are, you know, it's what in the aesthetic tradition is called the sublime mode, which is something that is so awful and terrifying that it becomes pleasing. And yet, listener Bill has sent us a question. Hi, this is uh, Bill Kerrigan from New Concord, Ohio, and I have a question about Megan Kate Nelson's excellent book, Ruin Nation. Uh, when I visit Civil War battlefields, I like to go out on the battlefield at dawn for an early morning run or walk because the the sights are so peaceful and serene. And it was only after reading Ruin Nation that I really recognized how strange this is, um, that you would seek peace and serenity at a place that was a site of something so not peaceful and so not serene. So my question is this, can we or should we try to change this reality? Could or should national battlefield parks do more to bring the experience of battle and its aftermath to visitors? Thank you. I think that they should. Um, I think we should try to change this whole perception of battlefields as serene. Because if our purpose here is to understand the past, we need to do a much better job of actually depicting the past on or through the landscape. Um, The National Park Service has chosen to approach this by a new initiative that they have to restore the landscape to its Civil War status, sort of with plantings and with tearing down buildings that weren't there before and sort of doing that sort of thing. But that also creates a very serene, usually rural landscape for people to look at and to walk through and drive through. And it doesn't really, it helps us to understand sort of what the soldiers were seeing initially, but it doesn't help us to understand the experience of battle um, because war was not uh, and is not still serene. So Antietam National Battlefield Park has done something interesting to kind of tackle this issue by placing some of Alexander Gardner's photographs of the bodies, as we were discussing just now, at the sites uh, so that you're standing there and you're seeing the Confederate bodies laying dead by the, you know, the Hagerstown Road, and you're seeing that image while you are standing in the exact place that Alexander Gardner was standing. So that as the visitor, you are making that connection between the past and the present, that here these bodies were in 1862, and here I am now standing in 2015 in this same place. And Being able to kind of make that leap, I think, is what actually allows us to understand what happened and the significance of what happened. I also, I had this discussion with a group of students, grad students at Virginia Tech a few years ago, and we were talking about how would we go about actually, because there are no ruins in most national battlefield parks, how would we then reintegrate them into the landscape? Because building a ruin is a very strange approach. That's a very odd kind of thing to do, but that's one way to approach it. One student had a really great idea, which I thought will not happen for some time yet, but uh, he suggested using holograms so that uh, the visitor would come and sort of press a button on a wayside, and then the image, uh, you know, would sort of leap out of the landscape at that very point, at the moment of the battle, and that you could experience it in that way. I think also Virtual reality might have some interesting applications for national battlefield parks that perhaps the visitors could be immersed in this world in that spot, even for just a couple of minutes, and that might help them access um, the destructiveness of the war a little more effectively. Americans have a really strange relationship with ruins. I had the opportunity to visit Germany last year, and you couldn't walk around Munich without a placard or an unfinished building or something that had been destroyed by World War II and the Germans telling you about it. You just couldn't escape the war. And yet I've been to the South and you can walk around the South and definitely not come in contact with the ruination that happened during the Civil War. Megan. Why don't ruins seem to have a place in the American landscape and in American material culture? Why do we have such a blockage when it comes to ruins? Well, part of the reason that the ruins, the Civil War ruins, do not exist any longer in our landscape, um, part of the reason for that is practical. So after the war, southern cities were focused on rebuilding and actually kind of getting past the war um, in that architectural sort of way, even though one would argue that the South has never gotten past the war. But um, so most ruins were actually torn down and or recycled uh, 
within 20 years of the war's end. So that you have buildings like in Chambersburg, where one of the bank buildings was actually rebuilt using the rubble um, from the destruction of the town. So that's interesting. So the ruin is there, but it has been reincorporated into the built landscape at, you know, as a sort of whole piece. Also, you know, forests grew over, amputee veterans died. So they've just, you know, the marks of war in that in that way are just not in the landscape. So we don't actually have them for those practical reasons. But there's also a cultural reason, which is since the early 19th century, Americans have really shown a preference for building and rebuilding rather than keeping ruins around as a material reminder of the past. Um, Americans tend to prefer fragments rather than ruins, so that they're more likely to take something from a ruin site or even a non-ruin site, like the tree outside the outside of Appomattox Courthouse, and take a little piece of it home with them. Or they're, you know, they'll go to see museum exhibits with fragments of bone or little bits of, of tree shards that um, have been saved from the battlefield. And they're more likely to sort of look at and value those which I don't consider to be ruins. Um, I consider them to be kind of fragments of the past. Um, they may have been part of the ruined landscape, but they, they do not actually evoke the kind of larger, either the tree or the building or the body that had been ruined in a really effective way. We also don't like to be reminded of terrible events or national failures. This is not part of the American narrative, and so... Uh, we just haven't really embraced that. Instead, we've in, embraced the sort of glorious progressive narrative of the war. And ruins would really interrupt that narrative and problematize that narrative. Uh, the only places where we have actually conserved ruins and kind of put them on, they're, they're still put on display because they're incorporated into a memorial environment. But the only time this happens is when an event is perceived to be perpetrated by some kind of outsider so that we have uh, the memorial to um, Pearl Harbor, where the ruins of the ships are still in the harbor underwater, um, because that was an act perpetrated by the Japanese. Oklahoma City, where Tim McVeigh is, is seen as an outsider, as an outlier. And then, of course, the 9-11 memorial site, in which there is an attack on American soil. I think we have a much harder time dealing with the Civil War because it was an internal conflict. And so the narrative that those ruins might um, convey is not as clear. It's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future but they can speculate about what might have been. Megan, photographs, as we have discussed, really shape the way that we think about the Civil War today. In your opinion, what might have happened if photographs and images of the Civil War had not been created? How would Americans' perception of the Civil War and the destruction that it wrought have been and be different? I think for Civil War Americans not having photographs would have severed a really vital link between the home front and the battlefield. Not only were people at home kind of viewing and then understanding the war through photographs and then also illustrations and newspapers that were taken from photographs, um, but they were also receiving photographs from the field of battle. Because photographers were there in camps, uh, they often set up studios, and soldiers would go and have their portraits taken. And doubtless, you know, your listeners have seen some of these portraits either in, uh, you know, Ken Burns's uh, Civil War or in a museum exhibit. And this was a way for soldiers to connect back to the home front, where they would sort of send these images as proof of life uh, in some in some ways, also as a kind of um, and a, a sort of evidence of their pride in their service um, to either the Union or the Confederacy. And people at home really cherished and saved uh, these images and, again, put them in albums or set them up in their parlors. And I think without those, they would have really lost this very important connection um, 
to the men who were away often for, you know, anywhere from three to three to four to sometimes five years uh, if they were not mustered out immediately. And that, I think, would have caused um, some real emotional stress, um, more emo- emotional stress than that people were already feeling. And I think for historians, you know, we would really be without a very rich, huge, vast amount of source material that shaped a lot of our arguments about the war. And Ken Burns certainly would not have been able (laughs) to make uh, his documentary, or at least he wouldn't have been able to make it so visually effective without the photographs from that period, and his film was very important. In 19, it came out in 1990, and it really jump-started an interest in Civil War history. And without it, I think there would not be as much support, perhaps, for national battlefield parks or museums or other kinds of programs related to Civil War history. Megan, we can't let you go without you telling us about your awesome blog, Historisa. Would you tell us what you write there and where we can find it on the web? Sure. Um, you can find it at uh, www.historista.com. Uh, you can also find it uh, by uh, typing in www.megankatenelson.com. But History Says is really a blog that, for me, works as a place where I can talk about all different kinds of issues. So some of the posts are about history and about history in popular culture. Some of them are about the practice of history. Um, I had a series of posts about a research trip that I took to the Southwest last year, or about things like the academic job market or the writing process. So I use it to really write all kinds of things that just are of interest uh, to me that I I find compelling and that I find um, moved to write about. Is MeganKateNelson.com and Historista.com the best places where we can find more information about you, your work, and how we can get in contact with you? Yes. Uh, there, on the website, you can find um, links to several things that I've written that are posted online. You can find links to videos um, from C-SPAN. And of course, there will be a link to this podcast when it goes up. Uh, and you can email me through the site as well. Or we could tweet you, right? Or you could tweet me. Yes, I'm at, uh, on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Megan Kate Nelson. Finally, before we really let you go, what aspect of history are you researching and writing about now? Is it as morbid as ruination? Uh, some parts of it are as morbid. Um, my project right now is a book called Path of the Dead Man, How the West Was Won and Lost During the American Civil War. Uh, it's a history of the Civil War in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado. And I'm really telling that history through the stories of nine people who experienced uh, the war in that region. And it does have uh, some pretty graphic discussion of what it's like to die of uh, dehydration and sunstroke which were very real risks that soldiers were taking when they went into the desert southwest without a regular and reliable water supply. Megan, I have to admit, when I invited you on the show, I thought we would leave our discussion depressed. But I think you have actually given us a lot of wonderful ideas to think about and to chew on. So thank you very much for sharing Ruin Nation with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. The American Civil War claimed approximately 620,000 lives. It destroyed landscapes, forests, cities, and the practice of chattel slavery. When we think about the American Civil War, the American War for Independence, the War of 1812, or any war for that matter, we tend to think of the battles. What we don't always think about is the cost of the war. Now, wars cost lives. We know this. But as Megan reminds us, they also cost landscapes, cities, institutions, and livelihoods. Some losses are bad, but some create new opportunities. You will find more information about Megan, her book, Ruin Nation, on the blog post page for this episode, benfranklinsworld.com slash 063. Now, if you have the Ben Franklin's World app, you can also click on the show notes link right from your app, and you can read them on your smartphone or tablet device. Bill, thank you for submitting a question via SpeakPipe. It was awesome for me to hear your voice and to hear you ask the question the way you wanted it to be asked. 
If you would like to ask our guest historians or me a question yourself, visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the Ask the Historian tab on the right hand side of the screen. From there, you'll receive instructions about how you can record a question that I can air on the show. The best way to find out about who our guest historians are and the topics we'll be discussing is to join our listener community on Facebook. The community is a really fun place to hang out. In addition to posing questions for our guest historians, we also chat about life, pets, food, and other fun topics. Joining the community is easy. Text BF World to 33444 or visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the big orange Join Now button on the homepage. These actions will allow you to receive the special link for our community. Finally, what aspect of Civil War ruination did you find the most fascinating? I mean, Megan covered so many different areas. Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.